singular honor for me as president of the International Planned Parenthood Federation to welcome you to this, the first African interregional dialogue, transferring the torch to tomorrow's leaders. You have heard the data on the numbers of young people in the globe and the numbers of young people in Africa. And you've also heard many times, I know, the issues around the sex and reproductive health and rights of young people, especially young people in Africa. You've heard of the incidences of unwanted pregnancy, HIV AIDS, and all of that. But sometimes we forget that young people are also a source of great energy, great intelligence, great strength, and in fact, hold the solutions to all those problems that we are so fond of enunciating. 70% of young people are unemployed, and only 5% of them are reaching university. And I want to make the link between sex and reproductive health and rights of young people and the achieving of reducing those goals. Unless we address the inequities, the issues of young people's sex and reproductive health and rights, their right to comprehensive sexuality education, their right to participate in the decision-making around these issues, we will not solve those problems. The fact is that young people do hold the answers, but they also need the guidance. And so it is with this in mind that IPPF has considered that an intergenerational dialogue was not only necessary, but needed to be done right now. The stakes are very high for sexuality education in Africa. There have never been so many young people as there are today, three billion strong, between the ages of 10 and 25 years old, and the figures are increasing, especially in developing countries. This spectacular growth comes at a time of rapid change. Humanities increasingly becoming urban. More than half of the world's population lives in cities today. This will reach to two-thirds by 2030, with 95% of the growth occurring in developing countries. Humanity is also on the move more than ever. The context in which young people are being raised is changing between, before our eyes. The manner by which knowledge is being transmitted between generations is evolving very quickly. In Africa, these developments are creating serious gaps in teaching of sexual and reproductive health and rights. Traditional social mechanisms on sources of information are eroding. In some cases, they are disappearing altogether. The results are very worrying. Knowledge levels about sexuality are very low. HIV incidence rates may be declining overall, but young people are still the largest single group for new infections. Girls are disproportionately affected. As I said, the sex are very high indeed. Sexuality education is a force for social transformation. It is a source of dignity for individuals. It is a foundation for healthy societies. It is an accelerator for reaching the Millennium Development Goals. Governments must design and deploy formal strategies for sexuality education. UNESCO's position is clear. We support countries in developing national, compulsory, and integrated sexual education programming, which is gender and culturally sensitive. For its part, UNESCO is forging ahead with school-based sexuality education as a key component of HIV prevention in the 25 priority countries identified in our new strategy. The continent has made through a lot of sacrifices for Africa to be where it is. It is because a lot of people sacrificed. They spilled blood, they fought, and we gained our democracy. It is time for the African youth to determine what they want to become. I personally feel that the youth of Africa should regard themselves as leaders of today. When we keep telling them that you are leaders of tomorrow, we are postponing their participation in development. <laughs> and in view of this, I urge African leaders to listen more to what the youth are saying. The youth need 
to be leaders of today and we need to create space for them. In spite of the, the fact that African youth are demographically, social and economically an important aspect of our society, they face challenges related to unemployment, HIV and AIDS, and inability to responsibly enjoy their sexual and reproductive rights. The picture of adolescent boys becoming unprepared fathers is worrisome. And young adolescent girls ending up in maternity hospitals with unplanned babies when they should be in school is a serious sign that our society has gone wrong. In particular, related to sexual and reproductive health, you face the following challenges. Negative cultural practices that are detrimental to their lives, poor positioning of youth and young people in our programming of SRH due to low investment and commitment, poor mentoring of our children on adulthood due to inability of parents to share correct and timely information to youth or at puberty. Conventional education systems that do not stimulate leadership and self-esteem. I have noted with great, with a deep sense of appreciation that this is the first African intergenerational dialogue on sexual and reproductive health and rights. For I sincerely believe that we need this dialogue. We need this dialogue, not only in this formal setting, but also in our different and rich traditional settings as Africans in order to pass on our experience to the younger generation. For humanity has since ancient times viewed these issues in the context of certain beliefs, norms, and traditions that govern particular societies, either in terms, in customs, and sometimes religious beliefs. The extent of the openness to which these issues are discussed differ from society to society, yet the common denominator, common denominator is that humanity has long recognized the sexual rights of all human beings. In our traditions and customs, as Africans, this was done on the clear understanding and knowledge that the young people are the future of our societies and nations. It remains my hope that our deliberations can benefit society at large. Adolescents and youth aged 10 to 24 years constitute over half of our population. This youthful group is a key resource for national development, as my colleagues have noted this morning, and we can only ignore the important issues that affect their lives at our own peril. It is critical that adults support young people to make responsible life choices. Things are always changing and the youth in Af of Africa can freely engage in discussions on various topics, including sexuality. You should therefore clearly, clearly articulate the issues that affect your well-being and direct your energies towards ensuring that they are placed high on the development agenda. This discussion should, however, be respectful and take into consideration our socio-cultural context, our cultural sensibilities and values. Only then will you, as young people, become agents of change. That sacrifice needed in liberation, not just for independence, for liberation, for development today, challenges the youth, not to simply say that the old should now give them space to lead, but to earn that leadership through struggle, like our elders did like indeed we are challenged today, but not blindly, through knowing and studying properly so that we can change our continent for the better in the context of our time. We had many, many issues uh, and our eldest and our youth 
they said, now we are in a new gen we are new generation. We have we are faced on very most challenges, and we have to face on some cultural issues. If we are urban in urban area, in rural area, in if we are girls, and that's why we open this dialogue to to push to push people, youth, and elders to go together and discuss on this issue. Because uh, in the 1970s, I remember chairing umpteen meetings and coming out even with the publication, the male involvement in family planning. And it went all the way down. I mean, men are more than three quarters the problem, if it is a problem. And so how could we say we were doing family planning and not involve them? Number two issue, which some of us have not been very happy talking about, is sex. One question that I asked the organization at one stage was, we say we are preventing pregnancies which are unplanned and so on, and we don't talk about how pregnancy is caused. These are changes that are happening. And I, I think uh, we are with it. One thing which was said, or which is perhaps in the minds of people listening to us, which we don't want to transmit, is not a handing over of the torch. In a relay race, when you hand the thing over, you are out of the race until they announce the result. That's not what we are trying to do with this. We are trying to make everybody understand that this is a symphony with everybody involved having their part to play. Largest population that is using social media is the youth, the mobile phones, the internet, and even on the internet, various platforms, Twitter, Facebook, um, chats and all of those things. It's the young people who are using uh, these channels to communicate and share information amongst themselves. So I think that the major role that the social media has to play is ensuring that young people have access to comprehensive information that helps them to make informed decisions about their sexuality. So I think that we can make good use of these platforms to ensure that young people are well equipped and well empowered with information that enhances their decision making. Young people need to know about the impact of their sexual life on their own livelihoods, on their community, on their family, in the nation that they are growing up in, so that they do not just follow what they are seeing in television or hearing on radio just because some uh, famous person is, is living that kind of lifestyle so that we can have well-informed young people making good decisions about their sexuality.